So today we're going to be covering Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 34. We're going to take the whole thing. Uh, half of it's a parable, so it'll go, it'll go quicker than you're thinking. But Matthew chapter 20. So this passage has a lot of great stuff. We're going to cover the first half pretty quickly, since it's a parable, and the parable is takes up a good amount of space in the chapter. But in terms of the uh, lessons, I think we're going to focus more on the second half. So we've talked about before what parables are. Parables are basically just a spiritual story that gives us a lesson. You know, they're not events that actually happened. It's Jesus just making an example for them using a story. So if we try too hard to fit doctrine into parables, things tend to fall apart. So we got to make sure we understand, like we talked about, what the focus of the parable is. If you try to build doctrine on parables and make it fit you know, we see this all the time, especially in the synoptic gospels and the gospels as a whole, where people basically try to act like Jesus is talking to a New Testament audience. Yeah, that makes all of his conversations literally meaningless to the people he was talking to. We're not in the church age. Jesus has not gone to the cross yet. He's talking to Jews. So it's important that we understand that. So basically what's going on here. And we'll, we will talk about application because there is New Testament application here for the church age. But the, the context of the passage, what Jesus is talking about here is going to be the Jews and the Gentiles. God uses people corporately and individually. So God obviously now, are Jews still getting saved? Yeah, of course. But is God using the Jews corporately nowadays to reach the world? No, right? He's using the church. We're in the church age. I think Chuck Missler used to explain it like a chess clock. You guys ever seen a chess clock? So basically a chess clock keeps time, but when you hit it, one side starts going, and when you hit it again, the other start, side starts going, but they never run at the same time. So basically, before the church, God worked in the world through national Israel. Then that chess clock got hit, and he began working in the world through the church. Now, what happens after the rapture is God hits that chess clock again, and he raises up 144,000 uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. No, he raises up 144,000 virgin Jewish males. It's so funny how they speculate about who these people are. No, he literally goes through the time. It's like some of the most valuable real estate in the book of Revelation, right? And he takes the time to name out specifically how many from each tribe. Yeah, that's because that's literal. He's like, no, this is what I'm going to do. So after the rapture, God will again begin working through the, the Jews corporately. But right now, that's not happening. Paul talks about that. If you want to dig in deep, you can read uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11, even parts of 12. And it talks about how right now, blindness in part has come to the Jews. That's not going to be forever. God will, one day again soon, work through national Israel. And when Jesus comes... And uh, sets up his millennial kingdom, which is so funny. It's all in our face, right? What's the name of the generation that's adults right now? The millennials. What's the most popular baby name for the last 10 years? Noah. It's always been in the top top one, two, three, you know, all around the world. As in the days of Noah, it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. He makes it pretty obvious for us, right? But God will, again, work through national Israel. He's not doing that now. But at this time... He was. So when Jesus is talking here, he's talking about how these people that were the workers early on, those were the Jews corporately. And do the Jews get offended? Oh, yes. Paul talks about this in depth. He says, I'll provoke you guys to jealousy with the people that were not a people, the people that didn't know me. That's you. <laughs> That's me. You know, look at our ancestors. I'm Danish, Scottish, German, and American Indian. Yeah, none of those cultures were worshiping God. We were doing like terrifyingly pagan things and horrifying, yeah, horrible stuff. And God now is working through people like us, just normal people from all around the world. God is using us to reach out to the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. That was not the case when Jesus was talking. So basically, what Paul talks about this in depth, you really should go read Romans 9 through 11, where he digs into this in depth. But right now, God is working through a people who were not a people, who were never close to him, who were afar off from him, who now have been made near through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we get what? Salvation. What does God give his slaves? 
salvation, right? We have a relationship with him. We have a relationship with our master. The term used for Christians in the New Testament is doulos, bond slave. Now, if you go back and read Deuteronomy and Leviticus where it gets into this, it's a slave that had been basically freed, but chose to stay with his master. So then we've been set free by Jesus Christ, right? But now we were slaves to sin. We choose instead to be slaves to Jesus Christ. Bob Dylan, when he was in his little Christian phase back in the 70s or whatever it was, he says, he had that song, everybody's got to uh, serve someone, right? Everybody's got to serve something. And that's the truth. You're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to Jesus Christ. There is no middle ground. So what they would do with that slave who wanted to stay with his master is they would take him to the doorpost and they would put an awl through his ear and put a little earring in it. That's why all you women are wearing... No, I'm kidding. But... Oh yeah, we're not political. You guys know this. Come on. It gets way worse. Simmer down. That was tame. But seriously, that you know, we're slaves of Jesus Christ, right? We're no longer serving ourselves. We're no longer serving our flesh. We're now serving Jesus Christ. And we get the same payment, right? We get a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We get our sins forgiven. You could even argue, like they're arguing here, that we get a better deal, right? Did we have to work as long in the sun as hard? Who did the work in Christianity? Amen. Jesus on the cross. Pretty good deal, huh? See how much sense this parable makes when you actually take it in context? The Jews are over there like, they didn't have to gut a bunch of animals. They just looked to Jesus, right? They looked to the, the serpent on the window, in the wilderness pointing to Jesus Christ. Go read John chapter 3. He's talking to Nicodemus about this. And Nicodemus is like, wait, what? Because it's a pretty good deal. And the Jews are provoked to jealousy now. They're like, ah, oh, this is totally too easy. We had to do all this stuff to have a relationship with God. But Hebrews talks about this. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. God says in Hebrews chapter 10, at the beginning there, he says, I wasn't looking for like the blood of bulls and goats. He's not like this weird deity that's like, I need the blood of animal. No, it was all pointing forward to Jesus, who was the real sacrifice that could not only cover sins, but completely wash them away. Were washed in the blood of the Lamb. What did John say in John chapter 1 when he saw John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We got a pretty good deal, right? So it's easy for the, the people that have been working in the heat of the day doing those Old Testament regulations and everything, and they look at that and they're like, man, they got a pretty good deal. Church, do we have a pretty good deal? For sure, right? Way, way better. We joke, if we were still under the Old Testament, you know, regulations and the Levitical law, you guys would all be broke. <laughs> you would have killed all your animals already. You would be out of business. So we're very thankful that we're under the blood and not having to work in the uh, heat of the day, so to speak, to use the imagery of the parable here. And that's basically what's going on here. So take a look at verse 2. We basically just covered verse 1, explaining the basics of it. Now take a look at verse 2. It talks about how they're, uh, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So that's basically a, a day's wage. So that's what's going on there. They're going and they're getting a day's wage. That's a good deal if you're going to work for a day, but that's a really good deal if you're only working for a little bit at the end of the day, right? And that's basically the imagery here. We're the Johnny come lately's, right? The church, we're like, we got a, we got a pretty good deal. We get a relationship with God. Did we have to do a lot of the footwork, a lot of the, the laying the foundation? No, we just get to be blessed by being grafted in. So it's a great deal. Take a look at verses three through seven. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. You know, you could look at this as like the uh, the people who came out, the mixed multitude who came out and basically became part of uh, Israel when they left Egypt, right? And then verse four, I mean, and verse five, and he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. These would be like proselytes, people that came into uh, uh, Judaism during that time when they were in Israel awaiting their Messiah during the time of the kings, these kinds of things. Uh, verse 6, and about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? <clears throat> verse 7, they said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. 
That's us, right? We got to go in at the last, at the 11th hour, right? We use that as an expression. We got a pretty good deal. And that obviously has provoked them to jealousy. But the reality of the situation is, and we'll talk about application here in a moment because application is very good too. What about the people that got saved on their deathbed? Is that fair? Yeah, of course. It's a relationship. You either have it or you don't. So we got a pretty good deal. You know, we're the Gentiles. We came, we got grafted in here through the cross, through the blood of Jesus. And like we just mentioned, there is some, some uh, relation here when it talks about application. How do we apply this as Christians? Well, like we just talked about, there's people in this room that have been serving Jesus Christ their whole life, right? And there's other people in this room who got saved this year. I know several of you guys got saved this year. So is that fair that we all get the same reward? Well, the same, we don't work for our salvation. This is where parables fall apart. That's why you don't get doctrine from parables. But basically the, the payment, and we know it's a free gift, but the payment is salvation. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're saved because it's a relationship. You can't do anything to earn that. All you can do is receive that. So if you've received it, then you're saved. So we get paid the same, whether we get saved on our deathbed, like my, my grandpa, or whether we've been Christians our whole lives. You know, my grandpa, he was not a good man by any stretch of the imagination. And on his, you know, I used to go visit him in the, the nursing home. He was, it was far away. So I'd go drive out there and try to talk to him about Jesus you know, all, every other word was GD this and GD that. And he, he was just that kind of guy. And he never believed in God, didn't grow up with it, nothing. He was Danish. So very, you know, post-Christian culture in Denmark. And one time I went out there and he had been in a coma. And he hadn't opened his eyes in weeks, hadn't talked in weeks. And I went out there and I talked to him and he opened his eyes and looked up at me. And he received Jesus Christ. I even did like test questions. And he was shaking his head no. And he's like, yes, like no. I'm like, oh, this is real. And that was real. And he came to faith in Jesus Christ and closed his eyes and never opened them again, never talked to anyone else again and died. It's a crazy thought. It's a relationship. Is God going to just abandon him because he didn't get a chance to work? If you think he would, you don't understand how worthless your works are. <laughs> yeah, you did nothing for God. <laughs> None of us do. He's like, oh, isn't that cute? It's like if you have a toddler and you're like, all right, honey, come help me bake the cake. And all the whole time, you're just trying to eat the raw butter and like handfuls of flour. And God's just like, you're so cute. And you're like, look, I did a lot of work. And then you're like to your siblings, you don't get to eat this cake. I made this cake. And God's just like, yeah, you're so precious. That's how our works are. So it's, it's really pride if we think that what we've done for Christ, serving him our whole lives, has made us like, oh, we deserve heaven. But that deathbed person, no, they don't deserve that. That's, you're confused. <laughs> you don't understand how useless you are. So we're, what's the Bible say? We're unprofitable servants at best. You doing great? No, you're not. So it's okay. We need to understand that. So that's basically the imagery here. So take a look at verses 8 through 15. It says, so when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed they would have received, they would have received more, but they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So this is a pretty interesting thing. We talked about this a moment ago. Sometimes God's grace offends us. And we don't like to admit that. But that's true. Every single one of you. If you I'm, I'm me. Me too. And if you doubt that, let me say one word that we'll all be like, oh, you got me. Pedophile. You hear a pin drop, huh? Yeah, get him. <laughs> yeah. Should pedophiles be able to go to heaven? If they repent, huh? 
Murderers, if they repent, if they come to faith in Jesus Christ and turn from their wickedness, God will forgive that. God will forgive anything except one thing. If you think you're good to go and don't come to him, he won't forgive that. Then you're covering, you're paying for your own sins then. So we all like to think of ourselves as gracious people, but at the end of the day, yeah, this parable is talking about me and you in terms of application. You know, we got to be very careful. Uh, oftentimes there's churches that are, they say they're hospitals for sick people, but in practice, it's kind of like a screening process. I'm sure some of you guys have been to those churches, right? Where it's like, if you fit the demographic of that church, yeah, you're good. But if you don't fit the demographic of that church, whatever they're looking for, you know, then they kind of treat you like an outsider. Yeah, that is not how the body of Christ is supposed to be. You know, that is absolutely shameful and embarrassing. Paul talks about in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, he's talking about all these different sins, and he mentions homosexuality and a bunch of other sins that are unsavory and socially unacceptable. And what does he say right after that? He says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were cleansed, you were sanctified. Isn't that beautiful? And if we ever lose that, then God will do a new thing. And he'll shut this place down just like he shut down a hundred denominational churches in this in this city in the last 10 years or whatever it's been. You can go to a lot of these churches. I mean, you know, it was tempting when we were looking for chairs to just call some of the, call some of the old dead churches. Be like, can we buy some of your chairs? I know you're not using them. But why aren't they using them? Because God's done with that. God's like, okay, cool. You're no longer reaching out to the sick. We'll raise up this weird looking goofy kid over here. He'll do it wasn't talking about myself. Th thanks, guys. No, I'm kidding. I was. I'm just messing with you. <clears throat> so, you know, God will do a new thing. We got to stay gracious. We can't be like these people and just, you know, this person's cool. They, their sin was socially acceptable. This, this other person, no, they're not, they're not acceptable. We don't like that sin. And so we need to make sure we don't become like the, the Jews in this passage, in the imagery of the parable, the workers who came out there early in the field and worked in the heat of the day. It's about coming to faith in Jesus Christ. It's about brokenness and repentance and receiving him as our Lord and Savior. And if we do that, then we have salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's easy to get offended. You know, the, the Jews, they were offended at the thought that the Gentiles would be saved. Why? Because you look at the stuff the Gentiles were doing back then, it was absolutely psychotic, right? Absolutely insane. You look at the pagan practices of these cultures, whoa. Like, without getting too graphic, imagine rolling Planned Parenthood into your religion. Right? That's what they're doing. So, and way, way other stuff. Really bad stuff. So, it was easy for them to be like, no, Gentiles were made for the Father to fuel the fires of hell. And that's basically how they looked at it. We talked about, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, how they had turned the court of the Gentiles into a marketplace. Why? Because they didn't want the Gentiles to get saved. It'd be like rolling up the Antifa crew and bringing them on in. Hey guys! <laughs> be like, uh, no, we're good. But that's exactly what God does. He fixes us up. He dusts us off. And then he sends us out to do the same with others. And God is no respecter of persons. You know what sin should bother you the most? We've talked about it before. Your own sin. Yeah, that's what should be bothering you. If you're on fire for Jesus, you're not like this, like, hmm. Oh, no, you're like, you hate your own sin, not your neighbor's sin. So, you know, that's Christianity 101, but tragically it's lost on people nowadays. And when we have that heart, it's like the prodigal son, right? Where he was upset that his brother came back and that his father treated him good. Shouldn't we rejoice? For sure, we should be rejoicing. So let's take a look at verse 16 verse 16 says so the last will be first and the first last for many are called but few are chosen and of course people don't know how to interpret their bibles so they isolate this verse and instead of exegeting it they eisegete it and they bring in their preconceived notions and look at it with their reformed tint colored glasses and act like this is talking about soteriology in the New Testament and the church age when it has nothing to do with that. And you see Calvinists point to verses like this and everything else. But if you look at the context, there's no leg to stand on there. What's being talked about here is very clear. It's talking about people that God, whether individually or corporately, people that God has wanted to use 
and hasn't used because you can be disqualified. And that's a terrifying thing. There's a lot of people that I've seen in my own life, my wife and I can tell you stories for hours about people we know that had a call on their life. And they're not doing anything for the Lord because of one reason or another. They've disqualified themselves. Put your hand to the plow and look back and you're not fit for the work. Look at the word there. It's not saying you can't go to heaven. It's saying you're not euthetos. You're not fit for service. So God's, God doesn't pick and choose who goes to heaven, but you're darn right that he picks and chooses who works for him. And if you meet certain criteria, God will use you. If you don't, he won't. God's very particular because his name gets dragged through the mud quite a bit. Flip on your TV to some televangelists and you'll see what I mean. There's a lot of people, some of the most terrifying things going on right now in the Christian landscape is people in ministry that were never called. You know, look at Hebrews chapter 5 verse 4. No one takes this upon himself except him who is called. It's a terrifying thing. And so we see that a lot where people have been called into ministry and yet because of some things they've allowed in their lives or some sin or being soft on sin or a foolish choice that they made one night you know, with a coworker or whatever, they're disqualified. And God doesn't use them for the kind of thing that he wanted to originally use them for. Does that mean God won't use them at all ever? No. No. He can do a different thing with them. But, you know, like when you see a pastor fall or, you know, commit adultery or what have you, yeah, that guy's not going to be preaching at that church anymore, even though I can name several churches in town where I know the pastors have had a fair and they're still in the pulpit, some of them quite big churches. But they can do something else. God can use them in some other way if he so chooses, but they put their plan, hand to the plow and turn back on that one, and they're not fit for that work. And that's not a popular thing to say, but it's what the Bible says. So we're not trying to make friends. We're trying to just rightly divide his word. And so there's a lot of people who have disqualified themselves. They weren't faithful. They got distracted. The cares of this world crept in. And we'll see that here in a moment as we uh, move on here. Take a look at verses 17 through 19. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. But the third day he will rise again. As Christians, we've got to always remember that we're following a crucified Messiah. This is not a health and wealth church because it's not a health and wealth Bible. It's just not there. The Bible says everyone who endeavors to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Sign me up. Sounds great, huh? No, but it's what the Bible says. I was at the thrift store the other day and I saw the, the book from Joel Osteen, Your Best Life Now. They got every day is a Friday. You guys, we've talked about it before. That's a terrifying thing because he doesn't mean it in the way that we do. We're like, yeah, it is your best life now serving Jesus, right? It's not going to be what you wanted. <laughs> it's going to be very different. You might be suffering quite a bit, but it's going to be a beautiful thing. And you'll be happier with that than you would be you know, serving yourself and all these things that will never satisfy but we see it all around the Christian landscape today where people want to ignore these parts like the disciples pretty much ignored it every time Jesus brought this, you know, stuff up. Yeah, sure. So you're going to take the kingdom now? Everything good? We gonna, when do we get to be governors? You know, and that's the mentality that a lot of people still have today. You know, Jesus, are you going to give me success at my job? Jesus, are you going to give me that new car, that new house, that new thing? It's a terrifying thing because that's so far from the heart of God. Jesus again and again tells us that it's hard for rich people to get into heaven. And everybody's like, well, I just want to be rich, Jesus. If we could make a little arrangement, I could give you some of my money. Is that what happened with the rich young ruler? Did he say, sell all your stuff and fund my ministry? No. He said, sell it, give it away. I don't need it. Come follow me. He wants you, not your money. But your money is usually the thing that your heart is wrapped around. We've talked about it before. It's the biggest idol in this world. And so God, he doesn't worry about these ancillary issues. He's after your heart. And so it's important to always remember that we're following a crucified Messiah. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. We've talked about this before. 
It's new desires. Because if you're in Christ Jesus, you're a new creation. You're no longer desiring that, you know, house on the bench or up in Eagle or whatever. You're no longer desiring that house out in the, the boonies with, with the acreage and the hunting. You know, no, you don't want that anymore. You want to be on fire for Jesus Christ. You want him to save your friends and family. You want him to give you opportunities to preach the good news to the people that he brings into your life. He completely changes you. We're following a crucified Messiah. And from time to time, you've all experienced it. God will find ways to take us aside, just like he took the disciples aside on the road here. He'll find ways to take us aside from our day-to-day -day lives and to remind us that we're called as Christians to lay down our lives. Does our flesh want to do that, church? How many of you guys just wake up in the morning and you're like, ah, Lord, let me not do anything I want to do today. Just totally sidetrack me. I know I wanted to clean out the garage, Lord, but can you just can you just throw a monkey wrench into that and just whatever you have, Lord? No. You're like, ah, oh, the <laughs> Lord wants me to do this. I don't want to answer the call. You know, and that's that's our human nature. That's our flesh. But the Bible's clear. If anyone wants to follow Jesus, we need to deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him. He's not calling us to live a comfortable Christian life. And if you want to hear that he is, you can find a bunch of other churches in town that'll tell you that. That's not what the Bible says. We can never forget that as Christians, we're called to lay down our lives just like Jesus did. Take a look at verses 20 and 21. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, that's embarrassing, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. So this is hilarious. Jesus is like, yeah, guys, I'm about to go get killed. It's going to be rough. And they're like, yeah, so uh, can we be like your right hand men? It's like, talk about a disconnect, right? They did not even hear what he just said. How awkward, right? How embarrassing. And it's a sad truth that many, many, many people worship, air quotes, God for what he can do for them. What can God do for me? And to be fair, that's kind of like a immature, simplistic way of understanding it. And most of us, we come to faith in Christ because we're like, man, I don't want to go to hell. That sounds rough. But that's where it starts. That shouldn't be where it ends. It's adorable when my, my little baby girl who was just born sits in front the front row here with like her little lips like, but if they're doing that when they're like 25, yeah, that's not as cute, is it? You're just kind of like, this kid's weird. So, we, you know, at some point we want to grow, we want to mature, we don't want to still be seeking these childish things and doing these childish things as we grow in Christ. We should be maturing in Christ. And so... A lot of people, they're like, you know, what can God do for me? And as you grow and mature in Christ, it should eventually become, what can I do for God? And then you realize, not much. Then you read Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it says, present yourselves as living sacrifices, which is your reasonable service. What's he want? Your whole life. What a slave's own. Church, what do slaves own? Liars. Right? We don't believe that at all. We're like, <laughs> shut up. Keep reading. So, you know, I mean, the reality of the situation is we know that that's the case, but we don't like that. Our flesh doesn't like that. Our flesh recoils against that. That's just human nature. We don't like to give our day. We don't like to give our time, our money. We don't like to give any of these kinds of things. We want to keep them for ourselves. And we can, but it will eventually destroy us. Because idols creep in to our hearts. And so a lot of people, they're all about what God can do for them. And it's tragic. But in terms of application, I think we can all see how this applies to our lives. This request from <laughs> Zebedee's, I mean, uh, from uh, James and John's mother shows where they're at. They're like, what can God do for me? And we're often very much the same. You know, we're often zealous for the kingdom rather than zealous for the king. We're often zealous for the reward rather than zealous for the relationship. And at the end of the day, 
Like we talked about, I, you know, I think it was two or three weeks ago. I don't want to go to heaven if Jesus isn't there. I just want to go wherever Jesus is. And that should be the heart that we have. You know, it may be selfish, but at least it's a spiritual request. So that's better. She didn't come up and ask for a, a Lamborghini, right? She's like, well, a good position in the kingdom. So at least, you know, that's not bad, but I think we can all agree that the timing was not so great. <laughs> Jesus is like, yeah, I'm going to die. They're like, so, can I have that when you die? Can I have your watch? It's like, <laughs> great, awesome. A for effort. Take a look at verses 22 and 23. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? I think it's Psalm 75 that talks about the cup of the wrath of God, undiluted. And that's what Jesus drank on the cross. That's why Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from God because of our sin. Terrifying thought. Was it forever, like some people teach? No. At the end, he says, Father, into your hand I commend my spirit. So it was just a little while. There's some separation. Chuck Mister used to say, I don't think we fully understand what Jesus gave up on the cross for us. And I don't think we will till we get to heaven. It's a terrifying thing. But... God loves you guys very much. He asks a lot of Christians because he gave a lot. And it's a good deal, especially when you recognize this is just a test. And one day soon, we're all going to check out of here and be standing in front of God like, what did I do with my life? The things that we thought were important. Oh, how unimportant most of those things truly are. So he's talking about the cup of the wrath of God. Jesus drank that on the, cu on, the, on the cross. What does he say in the garden? Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, right? The reality is, church, is this life is a zero-sum game. You guys ever heard that term? A zero-sum game is a game where for one person to win, the other must lose. Poker, chess, monopoly. Tag, right? These are zero-sum games. You can't have two winners, you know. So when we understand that, we look at life differently. Life, especially the Christian life, is a zero-sum game. In order for our walk with God to be thriving, our selfish desires and ambitions need to be crucified. You can't play both sides of the fence. You can't serve two masters. It doesn't work. And as we talked about before, it really comes down to this. What sky do you want to shine in? Do you want to shine on this earth? Or like Daniel 12 verses 1 and 2 talks about, do you want to shine like the stars in the firmament eternally? Where do you want to shine? Where do you, we use the example before you guys probably remember of like the, you know, the first class trip to Detroit. And then the riding coach between a crying baby and a fat, stinky guy to go to Maui. We all are like, of course, I would rather go to Maui, right? The flight's not very long. And yet we look around this world and we look around the church. And most people are absolutely choosing to go to Detroit. Everybody's picking this little grain of sand of a life and throwing away eternity with God. So we can be comfortable in this short little test that we call life. And we've talked about why, and it offends everybody when I say it. It's because we don't believe what's written in this book. Because if we really believe what was written in this book, absolutely would not be doing that. 100%. Yeah. So I know nobody likes to hear that, but it's the truth. And if we live on fire lives for Jesus Christ and burn down our lives around Jesus Christ, then we're showing that we actually believe that. But if we don't, we're showing that we don't believe that. It's that simple can't have it both ways. Now, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they wanted to shine in eternity. So that's good, right? They're like, in eternity, can we be at your right and left hand? That's good. But that was going to have a price attached to it. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Like, can you drink this cup? Oh, like, yeah, we're good to go. It's a zero-sum game. There's going to be suffering attached to that. There's going to be hardship. And that's what this passage is talking about. You're going to be treated like your master was treated as a student above his teacher. No. The world hated Jesus. It's going to hate you too. 
You're going to be offensive and distasteful to the world. That shouldn't surprise you. Is it worth it, though? Absolutely. Romans 8.18 8, says, for I, considering this, for I consider the sufferings of this present age, this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So it's worth it. Is there a high cost? Yeah. Is it worth that cost? 100,000% absolutely. Take a look at verse 24. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. <laughs> You're like, wow, these guys are so much more spiritual than James and John. No, they wanted the same thing. So they're like, what's up, man? That's not fair. You had your mom ask? You dusted off the mom card, bro? So that's all that's going on here. It's actually pretty hilarious. They're come on, like, come on, bro. What's up? That was not cool. Because you know, all the time they're arguing with each other about who's the greatest in the kingdom, right? It's not like they all got spiritual for a moment and they're just like, I'm I, Jesus, I would never ask that. Like, I should have thought of that myself. Why didn't I bring my mom over? <laughs> so hilarious. Uh, verse 25, but Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet, verse 26, it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. As Christians and as servants in the body of Christ, we should always look to Jesus for our cues on how to properly minister to people. There's a lot of advice floating around out there on how we should minister and how we should disciple. There's books and books and books all about this stuff. Well, think about this. Did Jesus allow people to be close to him? Did Jesus allow himself to be vulnerable and to get hurt by people? Did Jesus have an, a, a respectable air about him? No. No. Jesus was lightly esteemed. And yes, he allowed people to hurt him. Yeah, he spent time with people. That's often not what we see modeled for us when we look at pastors. When we think of a pastor, we usually think of them as a respectable, hey, yes, hello there, hello, yes, yes, my dear, yes, yes. We, we, we say that. I've actually had people say to me like, you're not a pastor. Like, I, I know, I don't know what's going on, man. But when I read the Bible, this is, you know, I, I guess I could work on my New England accent a little more and I'm not going to say it. do other stuff. But <clears throat> it's crazy. You know, people will put up with horrible, horrible stuff. And you, some of you guys have put up with just absolutely horrible garbage in churches as long as the person acts respectable. Jesus was lightly esteemed. He was lightly esteemed. He was despised. They rejected him. But in our flesh, we're just like, man, that pastor's embarrassing. Oh, it gets way worse. You haven't even asked my wife, poor thing. But the truth is, Jesus himself was lightly esteemed. Isn't that a crazy thing? It's a crazy thing because we all want to be respected. Respect me. When you think of a pastor, do you think of a celebrity? Yeah, no, but we shouldn't though, right? We often do. But a lot of pastors, they have basically the, the trappings and traits of a celebrity. Jesus was famous, but he had none of those trappings, did he? Jesus was not at all like that. Jesus was accessible. Jesus was poor. Jesus was genuine. He was the exact opposite of what you think of like a, a carefully curated personality. I remember talking to a lady who came to our church in Buffalo from the big church in town who copied their name from Calvary Chapel. So anyway, she came and she's like, oh, he is such a humble, genuine man. I was like, have you ever met him? She's like, no. I was like, yeah, that's a carefully curated personality. You have to make an appointment with his, his assistants just to even like talk to them. Like there's no, there's no accessibility. There's none of that. But that's a carefully curated persona that people buy into and people love that. People don't like that. It's like easy. They're like, well, it's kind of like with salvation, right? They're like, well, I, I want to feel like I earned it. Like, no, it's a free gift. We're like, mm, I don't like that. I want to feel like I earned it. 
It's not how it works. At least it shouldn't be how it works, but too often it is. Too often we have pastors that are like celebrities and, you know, you, you call them or email them and you get like their secretary and their assistants and these kinds of things. You can text our church. It's like, hey, what's up? Yeah, that's me. So yeah, it's calling the phone and be like, hey, what's up? What's going on? Yeah, we can get coffee. It's supposed to be how it is. It's supposed to be normal. That's how it was with Jesus, right? They try to bring their kids and they're like, no, the disciples are like, no, get those kids away from him. Jesus is like, what are you doing? Those are actually the harshest words he ever used at his disciples. He was upset with them for doing that. And yet all too often, that's exactly how the church culture is nowadays, right? And look at the words Jesus is using here in verses 26 through 28. He says, slave, serve, servant, ransom. Are these the words you think of when you think of a, a pastor? They should be, right? This is what Jesus is talking about. Servant, slave, serving, pastor, I mean, a ransom. That's, that's how it should be. That's the mentality that we should have. Are we using people to build the church or are we using the church to build the people? I was talking to, uh, I was talking to a friend who used to go to one of the, the big churches in town up on Chendon Road. There's two there, so you can guess which one. You won't be able to because they're so similar. But he was talking to one of his friends that still goes there, and they were, I think it was that, and he was, they were talking about the, how everything was last week, the Easter thing, and it was like, we had, we had nine services, and then this many people came, and th that was like their after-action report on how awesome what happened was. Not a single mention of Jesus Christ, not a single mention of the gospel, just all numbers as they're there in their $25 million building or whatever. Oh, you can't find a parking spot at that church. Straight up. A lot of you guys used to go to that church. A lot of you guys had no problem with that for a while. Then you're like, something's not right here. You ever been to a model home and you have like the bananas on the counter and you pick it up and you're like, oh, this is plastic. Wait, what on earth? Yeah, there's a lot of fake fruit in the church. And we confuse numbers with faithfulness. God does not care about any of that stuff. I am not afraid of this church failing. I'm afraid of this church compromising. I would rather shut the doors here than compromise. It's a terrifying thing. This is not a joke. God's not a joke. The focus has always got to be on Jesus. The focus has always got to be on serving. The focus has to always be on the word of God. And so often we mourn the fact that the church is impotent, and it is, and that the church gets walked all over by the world, and it does. But isn't that exactly what Jesus said would happen if the salt loses its savor? He told you that was going to happen. Yeah, you wonder why the world is influencing the church more than the church is influencing the world? Because you don't care about righteousness. I don't care about righteousness. That's where it's at. It's, this didn't just magically happen. It's because we forgot that the Bible says holiness without which no one will see God. Do you hear what he just said? That's terrifying. Holiness, without which no one will see God. What? That is crazy. Yeah, that is the word of God. Be ye holy, for I am holy. God's not a joke. We shouldn't have a celebrity mentality. We shouldn't be acting like we're the cat's meow, wearing, you know, $2,000 sneakers or $20,000 sneakers nowadays. It's terrifying. Jesus said this would happen. We've talked about it before, a local church that I know some of you guys went to a different church that's out here. They just had a heretical conference. They made six figures in ticket sales at that conference. We've been open for almost a year. I think we brought in about half of that. <laughs> one, one conference. Terrifying, right? Servant, slave, serve, ransom. Or celebrity, respectable, likable, comedian. Whatever. What's our banner? Where's our heart? And you vote every Sunday with your attendance and with your support. That's a crazy thought, right? We get the churches that we want. It's not apostasy like these churches have all gone bad. It's the people. They put up with it. Nobody cares. Guess what happens if nobody goes to a restaurant? It closes, right? 
Guess what happened if nobody has an appetite for vomit teaching? Church closes. These churches are open because we like that. We like to have our ears tickled. It's a terrifying thing. We get the churches we want. We get the pastors we want. Read Jeremiah. It talks about that. Take a look at verses 29 and 30. <clears throat> now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. And of course, the irony here is you've got these two blind guys who can't even see, yet they see clearly who Jesus is as the religious leaders are like, we don't know, we're not quite sure who this is. They're like, Lord, Kurios, right? God, son of David, calling him the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one. Save us. They saw it, but the religious leaders didn't. Pretty hilarious, really. It's not that they didn't see it. John 3, when Nicodemus talks to Jesus, he makes it clear that they knew who he was. They didn't want to see it. And a lot of people are like that today. They don't want to see it because then it means that their lives have to change. And so what do they do? They cry out to him. They pursue him because only he can save them. What a great model for us, right? Take a look at verses 31 and 32. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, For a small donation, I... Oh, wait. No, sorry, sorry. Uh, what do you want me to do for you? There will always be people that try to talk you out of coming to faith in Jesus Christ. How many of you guys have noticed that? There will always be people who try to talk you out of closely following Jesus Christ. Often people who are Christians. Right? Often people who are not on fire get upset at the people who are on fire. And they're like, ah, I don't like that. Come to him anyways. Follow him closely anyways. There will always be people who try to get you to compromise and not do what the Lord showed you to do. Do it anyways. It's worth it. Then there will be other people, like the mother of James and John here, who will ask for the wrong thing. Seemed like a spiritual request, right? Seemed spiritual. They didn't ask for like the, you know, the, the nicest sword or tunic or whatever. But like we always talk about, a good thing becomes a bad thing when it takes the place of the best thing. Should the focus be on the reward or the relationship? For sure. It's like the church you see where they're all about the Holy Spirit. Well, that's weird because the Holy Spirit's all about Jesus. Kind of confusing. I don't get it. John 16 says the Holy Spirit always points to Jesus. Why are we focusing on the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit's focusing on Jesus. Right. We don't want to put the cart in front of the horse. Better than desiring a position in the kingdom is desiring obedience and closeness to the king. I can't remember. I think it was Swindoll who said, Joy is the flag that flies when the king is seated on the throne. Isn't that beautiful? We talk about how you can have a relationship with God without having fellowship with God. If you sin, it breaks your relationship. No, you don't lose your salvation, but it does break fellowship. And that's a sad thing. That's a hard place to be, as a lot of you guys know who've been there. It's not fun. Closeness only comes through obedience. Think about that. Don't feel close to God? Examine your life. What are you doing that he doesn't like? So often we desire the, the wrong things, even as Christians in this life. And so, so often, God will give us the desires of our hearts and send leanness into our souls. It's a terrifying thing. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 106. Psalm 106, and we're going to start in verse 7. And we're going to read to verse 15. Psalm 106, starting in verse 7. 
Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it dried up. So he led them through the depths as though as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who, hate, who hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their souls. Oh, how often that happens in the Christian life. We think something will make us happy. Of course it can't. But do we listen? No, so God's got to give it to us. He says, okay, here you go. Church, does that thing ever make you happy when you get it? It's empty. There's no joy in that. There's no peace in that. Those things only come from Jesus Christ. It might distract you for a while, but eventually you'll be like, yeah, this is empty. This isn't doing it for me. Only Jesus is going to fill that desire. We need an eternal perspective. We need that God would open our eyes. And that's exactly what these guys are asking for here, that God would open their eyes. And that's what we see in verse 33. They said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. If you are in Jesus Christ, God has opened your eyes. So most of you guys here in this room, God has opened your eyes. So set your eyes on things above. Don't get distracted by the things going on in this world. You need to keep an eternal perspective. You need to live your life in light of eternity. Don't get offended at God's grace like we saw earlier in the passage. Don't allow your heart to focus on the rewards more than the relationship like we saw with the mother of James and John. Remember to serve rather than to lead, because that's true leadership, serving, just like Jesus modeled for us. Keep seeking Jesus. Your eyes have been opened. You see this life for the test that it is. Now do what these blind guys did and follow Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, it is sharp sometimes. It is cutting. But Lord, we need that. We need to be smacked around a little bit from time to time. Lord, this world is uh, transmitting the exact opposite message to us 24-7. So Lord, we're thankful that we can come here and we can dig into your word and hear what you have to say about these things. So Lord, we pray that we wouldn't be influenced by the world. Lord, we pray that we would live our lives for you and only for you not being distracted, not getting frustrated by things that we should just let fall to the wayside, but Lord, focusing on what really matters, living out this Christian life, seeking a deeper relationship with you. So Lord, we pray that you would foster that in us through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Keep us close to you. Keep us humble. Keep us broken. Keep us seeking your face. And Lord, we pray that you'd bless the time of fellowship that we're going to have now. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Reaching out